Good morning. Um, I'm Andrew. Um, I'm a co-founder and CEO of a company called Density. We build a, an anonymous people counting system that gets deployed into large offices. And along the way, I've met some really amazing people, uh, all of which are sitting to my right. They're much more interesting than I am. Um, so real quick, I was hoping we could do intros, and then we'll dive into a little bit about their experience and background and some of the things that they've learned. So, Omar? Uh, yeah, my name is Omar Ramirez. I'm the Senior Program Manager for Workplace R&D and Projects at Atlassian. Uh, what that really means is I get to build spaces and then hypothesize about future solutions for those spaces and then test them in real life, which is great. Hi, Chris Ortiz. I'm with LinkedIn as a Data and Engineering Program Manager on the Workplace Performance and Innovation team. And uh, what that means is I help with the engineering side at MEP controls of uh, our build-outs, as well as driving the data strategy for how we gather that data and how we use it. I'm Tracy Weiner, Vice President of Workplace at Knoll. I'm still not sure what that means. Um, but uh, <laughs> we work uh, with many organizations to help shape the workplace strategy and then uh, curate solutions to, to fulfill it. So Tracy, um, you've been a designer, an educator, a researcher. Um, you've been at Knoll for 16 years? Yes. Okay. Um, I imagine that you've seen uh, a lot of change in physical real estate. I'm curious, like, what were they thinking about 16 years ago, and what are we thinking about today? Wow, 16 years ago. Um, well, I think, you know, one of the things that's been going on, especially from a historical context, as we look at broad art, real estate was really driving the game. Uh, and it was, and I think we're still talking about that in some instances where it's efficiency and how does real estate be efficient and effective and all those types of things. But we reached this point where all of a sudden the conversation shifted to people. There was a notion of how do we really empower our people? I mean, if you look at what organizations cost balance is, you know, they have much more higher investment in their people than they do in their real estate. Um, so one of the things I think has been enlightening from a, a workplace standpoint is the fact that we've been, that conversation shifted to really, how do you encourage humanity in the workplace, how do you bring the human aspect into the workplace? Does that mean that like spaces get designed on the fly or moved around? Does that mean that you're, what, what does that mean practically? Right, I think practically, I think there's a better sense of what it means to socialize. Um, you know, I, I think there's this whole notion of, um, you know, the, the technology factor, of, you know, people so collaborating around uh, technology. But also there's a basic human interaction that has to be facilitated by a workplace today. And how does that human interaction really facilitate itself? So it may tweak, and I think, you know, hopefully we'll get into you know, data's role in maybe seeing some of these uh, spaces more. So Crystal, um, you're an engineer, you've worked in energy, uh, you've worked in workplace, your team has exploded recently. Um, what, what are you doing at LinkedIn, and, and how does engineering play a role in, in its outcome? Yeah, I think engineering and technology are playing a huge role um, in the way we build out buildings, build out space. I think technology has helped us kind of close those gaps to understand the behavioral piece of how people behave and understanding how people behave. Um, because you can sit and, you know, gather data and gather surveys on whether they're happy or not, but understanding how they work every day, how they collaborate, how they make sales. Um, that's something that we're trying to understand so that we can better build out spaces. And essentially, when we look at everything we do is, when we look at technology, for example, the foundational question is, does this improve the employee experience? And if it doesn't, then we're probably not going to go for it. Um, and that's kind of the question that we always ask ourselves. And, you know, the data is sort of the, the benefit of, of using these technologies and you know, looking at the engineering and how you tie it all together. Do people argue over space? Yes. <laughs> what, in what form? What does that what, what does that take? All the time. Um, we get some pretty ridiculous asks, if you ask me, of, you know, people wanting personal offices. Um, for example, it's a big one, and at LinkedIn, it kind of goes counterculture um, because we try to have everyone, including leadership, work in open environments where they're more accessible, approachable. Um, and so just the other day, we had a someone senior within the company, um, they had a reserved office space in the building, and they didn't want to go kick people out when people went in there when they weren't supposed to. And so they were asking for a second office space. And I was like, 
well, that's not going to fix your problem. You're just going to, now you're going to have two spaces with people coming in, you know, that you're going to have to kick out. And so we get these things all the time where there's people fighting for war rooms, um, reserved conference rooms, and data helps us justify and have that conversation with them. Um, having the data doesn't mean we just go execute on the data. It means it enables us to have a more meaningful discussion and get them to look at the data and help us understand, you know, this is what we're seeing, what do you see? And it just sort of helps us come to an agreement, I think, much quicker and something that's reasonable for everybody. So, Omar, um, you've been Google, Netflix, Dropbox, uh, Stripe? Yeah. And now Atlassian. Yeah. Um, would you say that, like, the purpose of physical real estate is is really to improve the employee experience, or to retain, or, or to somehow recruit. Like, what is the primary function of, of real estate? Productivity. So productivity is one point. I think the, the primary function of workplace experience and the workplace in general is to bring people together, right? It's to build that community for your company, and that community is based on the culture and the values of your company, right? It's kind of like taking your culture and matching it with your strategic vision for your real estate, like combining those two things is what makes great experience. Um, I think you know Crystal and Tracy both are getting at this and that, but you can have all the data you want to kind of support the framework for your workplace, and you can have like all this data. But if you don't have buy-in, if you don't have that culture to support it, you're never going to get very far with that data because data is just a support structure. Um, you need to have that kind of like buy-in from people in order to get that people to actually, uh, I guess, utilize the space the way that you want them to, or the way they like you are designing it for. Um, you also can't really force things in that. For example, when I was working at a company a long time ago, which will remain nameless because of NDAs, uh, we did a massive study about the size of offices because we had private offices. And the, one of the C-level executives said, hey, let's study the data. Let's see if we should right-size everyone's offices because everything was like growing over time. And someone had a 20 by 20 office, someone had a 10 foot by 10 foot office. And we fed them all this data and we said, hey, here's the data. We, this is how we can right-size the offices. Um, and he said, no, uh, all the new people get smaller offices. And it's like, oh, okay, great. So like, we're not going to do that. Okay, that's fantastic. But the thing is, there we didn't have buy-in yeah. from anyone. Do you now? Uh, we do now. Yeah. So our vertical at Atlassian actually reports directly to the chief people officer. So in that way, we're advocates for the people as opposed to um, advocates for finance. So you have a new building that's opening. I yeah. presume you would not be here if it were going poorly. Uh, no, I would not be, yeah. I think, I think you said as much. Uh, this is on Monday that it opens? It opens Monday, yeah. Um, uh, how did you, can you, can you tell us what the total square footage was, and can you also tell us how you decided on that square footage? Yeah, so this square footage is 105,000 square feet. Uh, it's across five floors. Uh, we decided on that, so we have, our metric currently um, is 150 square feet per person. That's divided into two different modes, so one for dedicated space, and the other one for um, kind of community space. Uh, I think that's pretty typical for most companies in the Bay Area, what I've found recently. Uh, just like you know, from the community of people that I'm involved with with workplace experience. Uh, that said, uh, we are doing some things differently in the new space and that we are providing dedicated meeting spaces to people. And the way we're measuring those, we're calling it kind of like a good global citizen or a good global teammate kind of thing, uh, is we are saying like, look, you are a person who is utilizing this room 90% of the time. So we're going to give you dedicated space. But if you if your utilization falls over time and you find you don't need it, we're going to know that. But we also just expect you to be a good citizen or a good teammate and just give it back. Gotcha. So, so not not the example from the NDA company. No, not the example from the NDA. Nor the example from the uh, senior executive <laughs> offices. So how do you know utilization? Uh, so we use, um, like obviously, sensor tracking, but then also uh, booking tracking through Google Calendar and Team as well. Uh, we actively monitor that. and then look at the reports every like month and then every quarter and then every half year to see how individuals are actually utilizing the space. We also use that to actually drive a lot of our decisions around the size of spaces we're doing. We do programming exercises before we do a build out as well and we do observation. The thing we found that unfortunately with people observation when you're using people with clipboards or like an iPad or whatever, um, people change the way they act. It's like when someone's being watched, yep. like they know they're being watched. It's like quantum mechanics. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You're automatically going to do like, the, the, do, you use, do you use this chair? Yeah. It's like, of course I use this chair every day. Right, and of if course. You, if someone's watching you, you're going to tell them you're using the chair, and you're going to use the chair. If so, someone's watching, you're not going to use the chair. So I, I want to get into privacy, so I'm going to come, come back to this, but I'm, I'm super curious. Like, is this how we design buildings? We, we, an architect says, look, here's your 100 square foot per head plan, here's your 200 square foot 
per head plan, and here's your 150 square foot per head plan. Is, is that how we design buildings? Um, and mostly I'm directing at, at, at you two. I, I know where you have a lot of experience. Well, you know, the programming still takes a big part of that. When I say programming, obviously from an architecture standpoint. Um, it still takes a, a big component of that in saying how much space we're going to purchase, lease, whatever it may be, allocate. Um, and then getting into the actual design of the building, I think the thing that is kind of really triggered is this constant iteration um, where it's, you know, we're way beyond the one size fits all. It's all, it's almost this constant iteration of what's next. And, you know, the example cited, you know, there's some things, there's some data that's driving it. Um, but also there's some user experience that's driving it. There's feedback from, from the users. Um, there's companies that have this incredible open forum for you to cite exactly what is wrong with your workplace and submit that and then you can, that becomes a ticket that gets acted upon. So I think there's this constant engagement that's going on um, that helps that design process I mean, a bit of a churn. You know, I mean, it's putting more pressure on the AD community, but I think it's also making the space a little bit more tuned to what the users are trying to do. And you all have been involved at every point in the process, everything from building selection to the interior design to you know, what amenities are we going to fill it with, um, you know, 18 months in advance, 24 months in advance of the space opening. Um, you know, Crystal, I'm curious, it seems like once you make certain decisions, they're baked, and you sort of have to live with the the outcomes, um, but but at the same time you're saying it should be flexible and you should have an iterative approach. So how do you iterate with real estate? I think it's extremely tough. Um, I think for you know engineering, especially once you design the controls of the HVAC for a building, you're kind of set. Um, I think one thing we try to do is make sure we're having those conversations with the business throughout. Um, we also take a sort of proactive approach in trying to understand what's the difference between how engineers behave and collaborate. Um, we know that engineers tend to, depending on where they're at in the phase of a project, they need different types of space to support their work. Um, whereas sales teams, you know, tend to be in the office Mondays and then attendance drops out off throughout the week because they're out making sales. Um, so we've tried to spend time to research and understand how these different teams behave to support the best workplace. Um, but I think there's always a balance between making spaces sort of adaptable and then the cost. Um, and I think you know what we've learned is that you can't just you know stick more people in a building or go completely open. Um, you know, and you also have to consider all these different factors, and it's just really a balance of you know, finding out what's everyone's different levels of flexibility and needs and trying to make sure that we support the worst case scenario. And that's at least LinkedIn's approach for now. And you have a really unique approach. Um, I'm, you collect a lot of data, you analyze a lot of data, um, you turn that into, you know, actionable outcomes of some kind. Um, how do you think about privacy? Um, you, I remember you making a very interesting comment about how LinkedIn classifies privacy. Uh, yeah. Could you explain that for us? Yeah, so they, we have different levels of privacy. Um, there's three different levels that we categorize it as. Um, and basically, number one and the worst is if you're getting down to personal identifiable information. And we've partnered very closely with legal um, to make sure that we're you know, GDPR compliant globally. And it took months <laughs> to get things approved. I mean, it, it slowed us down um, for at least two quarters. and there, But I think in the end, we're all very happy with where we're at. Um, we don't look at data on an individual level. Um, it, it, sometimes there are exceptions for different use cases or scenarios, and every single one of those exceptions has to go through legal. Um, but in general, you know, we look at I guess if you want to put a word to it, it's sort of like behavioral topologies of different types of groups of people and different teams. Um, and that's really where we're trying to get an understanding is if we can understand different teams and how they behave, um, then we can better support. And it's not just workplace, but also all the programs that come along with it. So food, transportation, travel, um, you name it. Omar, do you think that like the future of all offices is going to include Essentially, you knowing everyone and which seat has been used, um, which seats have not been used, which spaces are empty, um, and, and sort of like what, what should our expectation be as, as employees um, as to sort of privacy and what's being tracked? 
I think that's a tough one because it, myself as an employee, I'm very rarely at my desk. I'm in meetings a lot. I go on site tours and I'm uh, traveling a lot for work. Um, I think the tough thing about, I, I, like, I love the idea of like a data-driven workplace that has utilization at its heart, right? And you can see where people are and you can understand how they're moving around the space and how they're utilizing it. It's a beautiful dream. I think the challenge of that dream is that you have the dark side of it, which is um, uh, if you have an unhealthy culture in your workspace and someone has access to that data, um, who can then uh, use it in a negative manner to mm -hmm. say like, oh, well, you're only at your desk for like two hours today. Like, what's up with that? Which <laughs> uh, is your goal, right? That's yeah, that's my goal. I, I'd yeah. love to just ask you. <laughs> uh, no, no one asked me that question, which thank you. Uh, I think that's the dark side, right? And I think that that's kind of what people fear about it. And I think that is a very important thing to keep in mind when you're looking at data. Um, I think the other tough thing about it is, to be honest with you, like at uh, technology companies, because things are moving so fast, uh, the second you have a good set of data, the second you have an understanding of your people or your space or your behaviors, technologies, um, someone goes and acquires a company, which is great. Um, but then there's a whole new set of people who are like this very like unknown entity to you, um, and you can't like actually talk to them for the first few months because of FTC regulations, and then you have to like somehow encompass them into your plans. Uh, so it's uh, it's a very tough thing when you have a set of data and someone just throws like a card over it every so often. So we have two insiders, and then we have uh, We're Noel. quite the outsider. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but who knows everyone and has worked with everyone. Um, I'm curious, like from your perspective, you get involved very early on. Um, how much of your work is helping them design space out um, and think through um, a company's uh, interior design or structure or layout? And how much of your, your role is coming in and trying to improve an existing building? You know, I think it's a little bit of uh, both. Um, you know, try to go in and uh, create an, an understanding. I, I love the fact that you now have used the word sales twice, which, I, you know, I love that you know, we do these things a lot, yeah. and people forget the fact that ultimately these companies to, to survive have to sell something. So thank you, number one, for that. Um, so I think, you know, you get to what is the goal of Our work. stuff is pro bono, I just want yeah, to clarify. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You know, you get to the point of that, you get to the point of what's the function of workplace today, it's, you know, it's facilitated sales. I mean, can you really, you know, do what you can do with all the ecosystem that has to go in place to facilitate that sale? I think that's a, a thank, so thank you for doing that, so that's one great thing. Um, so we're in early on to really make sure that that business strategy is, is matching what the real estate facility strategy is. So, and then also, as, as that gets rolled out and implemented, is there continuity to that? Is there iterations? You know, if things change, that type of thing. Yeah. But I want to pick up on, you know, Omar, you opened up the door about you know, the dark side of data. Um, I always like to say that big brothers on a hospital ship sailing away somewhere you know, on life support. Because as Edward Snowden said, the minute we all purchased a device and then we purchased this with our money and then gave all the control of it off to third parties, the notion of big brothers out so you're saying ship is sailed? Yes, completely, completely. What, what, uh, so does that practically mean like cameras everywhere? They are. Like in bathrooms, like right. above <laughs> conference rooms, above I hope engineers' desks? But I think there's more and more we're seeing the proximity of cameras everywhere. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just, it's just become this reality. You know, you look at, you know, you, we've got a better role to play as humans from a data standpoint data management standpoint. I mean, you look at just what's happened, you know, we have data platforms out there that there's this vile stuff going out on, and we're not managing, controlling that. So, some wacko and some pipe bombs, some idiot can go into a synagogue and shoot people, and the people that manage the data are going like this? No. It's not appropriate. Just so, appropriate. so just to clarify, you're saying that while the ship is sailed, and we should all just sort of assume that we're being surveilled, mm -hmm. uh, that you're not necessarily endorsing that. No, not at all. But I mean, I think it's a reality we have to face. And I think to your point, Omar, it's like how that, you know, there's this notion of big data that's being collected on a massive scale. But what about the micro data that's really going to influence people's lives? And I think that's where it really comes into play. And I think what you spoke to about how it can really make someone's experience better in the workplace is a great thing. Well, and I think, I think to the point of like, if you look at data and you look at the way like the influence that people like ourselves have in, within our 
our community, if you want to call a company that, like right, like that community, you are then responsible, it's very responsible for managing that properly, right? And it's like there's a lot of pressure, I think, internally, especially now, to be very forthcoming about how you're using information, and especially be very transparent within the company. And we're, we're like, we, that's not something we actually really strive for within our company. Is like, you know, being we, we call it open company, but like everything is open to the company. I'd be like, if someone asks me a question, like, oh hey, like how do we figure out how we're going to do the conference rooms this time? Like, oh, well, actually, we track the data through this, like, you know, the schedule that you check into every time through your Google Calendar, and, like, it's anonymous, but, like, heads up, that's what something we do. Uh, we'll, we're open to talk about that. I think that, I guess what I'm getting at is that it's, it's our responsibility as people who are at these companies running workplace experience or real estate or facilities, whatever you call it, to be um, good citizens to uh, our communities and then good citizens to our, uh, like, the, our global, like, team. The good so, caretakers of that data and yeah. those people. Yeah, absolutely. I want to um, open it up for questions. We have uh, about three and a half minutes left. So if you can use just that application to post uh, some of your questions, I'll try to work some of those in into the discussion. Um, oh, we've got a bunch. Okay. Uh, yeah, you've got some great stuff. Can, am, do I get to choose? Is that okay? You get to choose. Okay, sweet. Um, what have you done, this is a good one, what have you done to get employees comfortable collecting data about them? I, I would love to know, um, yeah. how, do you, how do you socialize that? So we've actually changed, like legal has gone and changed some of their documentation, so that's you know, kind of the formal way to, to do it. Um, but we also just put out, like for example, when we installed density in cafes, um, we put in, we have internal links that we have, so we created a Go link or, and called it cafe count, and then just showed them exactly what the image, still image, would look like, you know, if the device were ever hacked, and then um, showed them charts of the data and what we were counting, and then explained to them that we're using it to predict attendance in future. We're at a point right now where we can predict attendance a week in advance for cafes, um, which is huge on, you know, the quality of food for the program as well as saving food and not wasting or overcooking um, amounts of food in the cafes. And employees are pretty on board with it, um, you know, so that's Good. Does, the, does the, data co the, the data collection activities that you do, this is kind of related to one of the questions, um, does it change based on the space type? Um, I imagine with like cafeterias, it's maybe, maybe a little bit different than conference rooms, which is a little bit different than private offices. Um, does it vary or do you find that it's, it's you're pretty much always trying to capture the same data. Is the room booked? Is the room not booked? Is there a camera there? But I think you made a good point. There's this, there seemed to be this emphasis on group-based data. Where, and, and, and I think also from a workplace standpoint, there's the emphasis on you know, the group spaces. You know, we always see the money shots of the groups. You know, with high-fiving everybody, everybody's gathered around, they have great curated coffees. Collaboration. Like, yeah. Collaborations everywhere. Yay, collaboration. Well, yay, yay. Yeah. Um, while the individual's been thrown by the wayside in many respects, you go, because you know, I always like to go into a space and say, well, where are people actually you know, sitting and working? And then they're in this little thing that goes up and down really well. But, you know, it's about, and so it's like, how do you make data benefit everyone? That it's you know, not only can, when they need those group spaces, they're available to them, they're right size, the technology works, all those other things. But also, what are those micro improvements that can in, in really improve the experience of the user at the spot where they may be doing it? So we have about 60 seconds left. Um, I want to do this super fast. You get about 10 seconds to answer. Um, if you were to like fast forward 10 years and you could have one thing that buildings don't currently have, uh, what would it be? Go ahead. Oh, no, first, okay, great. <laughs> uh, we moved down the line. Uh, I would say flexible wall systems. It's like a pipe dream thing, but honestly, just you can never like, have the right amount of spaces. Like changing. Change management is just so hard. You gotcha. a space. We build these spaces. All of a sudden, we need to change the size of a room or cut it in half, it's a nightmare. I think uh, a personal bubble for temperature control. <laughs> so, but it, it seems to be the biggest problem and the one that I that I see really difficult to solve. Like a cone of silence yeah, that's exactly. like temperature regulated, <laughs> yeah, hot cold. Exactly. Um, I think I'd like to see the data going from documenting the past to predicting future behavior and that being linked to the ability to, of spaces to morph such that we know, because of the data we've collected, that this experience is going to be happening on Wednesday at 2 o'clock, and that space somehow shapeshifts to the company back. 
So can we give uh, this crew a round of applause? They've been excellent. Stimulating discussion. Has the big brother ship sailed? I don't think so.